Good morning and welcome to the service from, well, it's us from Kinmaley's Church. Um, I'm going to pray briefly at the outset of this time of worship and uh, then after that we'll uh, listen to God's word. Isabel is going to read it. So just now I'll uh, I'll pray. Lord, we give thanks that you are with us today. This is your promise. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is your promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be with us today as we read your word together. Help us to take it on board, to take it in and to put it into practice. We pray for the help of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Exodus chapter 28, verses 9 to 12. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in the order of their birth. Six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones, the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in the gold filigree settings and fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. And verse 29, whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. And Luke chapter 22 verses 31 to 34. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And John chapter 17, verse 9 to 15. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost, except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Thank you, Isabel, for that reading. The Bible tells us repeatedly and in different ways to support one another in prayer. I suppose the supreme example in supporting one another in prayer is given by Jesus 
when he says in John chapter 17 and verse 9, I pray for them. He prayed for the disciples, but his prayer extends across the ages to you and to me. He prays for all who will believe on him. How wonderful that we today are embraced within the prayer of Jesus. In fact, Jesus spells out his prayer for Peter as an individual. He says in Luke chapter 22 that Satan has desired to have Peter and uh, Jesus prays for him. I have prayed for you, Jesus said. I wonder how many times we, when we meet a friend in Christ, can say to them as we meet them, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. Jesus could say that when he looked Peter in the eye that day. I don't know if you've read the book by St. Augustine. It's called The Confessions of St. Augustine. It's kind of a life story. It's it's full of very deep thinking, but in the middle of that uh, book, he also tells that at one stage he was afflicted with horrific toothache, and he spoke to a number of Christian friends, and he asked them to pray for him, and they prayed for him that he would be relieved from pain, and the pain lifted so that God answered their prayer. So he experienced the blessings of being supported in prayer by his brothers and sisters in Christ. So Jesus says, as our supreme example, about his people, I pray for them. I was thinking about this recently because Bethany Hamilton who is uh, on a year's training with Youth for Christ, was uh, recently performing at her first Christian concert during this year of training. So I was praying for her, and I'm sure others were praying for her too at, at that time. Well, I want to come on now to this point. We need... Jesus prayers. Think about this for a moment. We need Jesus prayers. First of all, we need Jesus prayers because of our sin. It says in Luke 9 and 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Can you believe that? The disciples they were fighting among themselves as to who would be the most important, who would have the most power, who would have the highest prestige and influence. Sin, pride, wanting to be first. Jesus needed to pray for the disciples because there was sin in their hearts and sin in their lives. Jesus needs to pray for you. He needs to pray for me because there is sin in your heart, in my heart, in your life, in my life. Also, we need Jesus' prayers because of the power of Satan. I've mentioned this already, but Jesus says in Luke 22 to Peter, Satan has desired to have you, to sift you as we... But I have prayed for you. Jesus stood between Peter and disaster. Jesus, in his prayers, stood between Peter and falling flat on his face, completely swept away from a life of faith. How much we need Jesus' prayers. One, because of our need for deliverance from sin and two, because of our need of deliverance from the power of Satan. 
Second thing I want to come on to is what does it really mean that Jesus prays for us? Think for a moment about the verses from Exodus 28 that Isabel read. These verses detail for us the dress, the robes of the Old Testament high priest. He had a breastplate which he wore over his heart and on the breastplate there were fixed twelve precious stones. They were sewn on to the breastplate. The, 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 the precious stones were different, the colours were different, the kind of tone of the precious stones would be different, the feel would be different, but they were there, stitched onto the breastplate, side by side, twelve of them, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is a picture of how Jesus has his people on his heart. I pray for them. Now also in Exodus 28 verse 29 it tells us that the Old Testament high priest had two larger stones, one on each shoulder, and on each of these larger stones were six names of the twelve tribes of Israel, six on the one shoulder, six on the other. So it's a picture, a, sim a symbol of the fact that the high priest represents the people of Israel as a whole, and that he carries them on his heart, he carries them on his shoulder. How wonderful that you and I as believers in Jesus have a place near to his heart. We have a place on his shoulders. If you feel need of love, then think about how close you are to the heart of Jesus as your high priest. The Old Testament high priest had this in a symbolical way. Jesus has it for real. He has you on his shoulder. His strength comes underneath you. How wonderful that in a day, in a moment of weakness, you feel desperately your need of being upheld. Well, Jesus is right there. He carries you on his shoulder. Because Jesus is our high priest, he acts for us, he prays for us, he represents us completely. The doors of heaven are open to us. All the blessings of God flow out to us through Jesus in answer to his intercessory prayer. As Hebrews 7.25 tells us, he is able to save to the uttermost or completely all those who come to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them. Third thing I want us to think about now is what difference does it make that Jesus acts and prays for us? We catch a glimpse of some aspects of this when we read the great intercessory prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. First of all, we're kept from evil in answer to the intercessory prayer of Jesus. He says in John 17 and 15, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. How wonderful when you feel your weakness and how close you are to giving in to temptation, that the prayers of Jesus come around you and lift you up and keep you from falling. Jesus prays that his people will be kept from division. He says in John seventeen eleven, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, so that they may be one, as we are. How wonderful again that when division is threatening within the church, 
division between one believer and another. The intercessory prayer of Jesus comes to, to glue them together. He's praying that they may be one as we are, his Father and himself. In Romans 12, Paul says, Live in harmony with one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Do we take this seriously? A third fruit of the intercession of Jesus is we're blessed with a holy joy, a joy which is of God. In John 17 and 13, Jesus says, I say these things so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Do you believe that? When you give in to sad thoughts, about the power of sin, when you give in to sad thoughts about the power of Satan, thoughts that drag you down. Do you believe that Jesus is praying for you, that you will be lifted up from these thoughts into a place where you will be filled with holy joy? He prays that his joy will be in your heart. I want to illustrate that there was a man called Harry Woods who was Welsh. He was part of uh, the congregation in Sandfields where Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones was minister before he went to London to become minister of, of Westminster Chapel. So Harry Woods was going along beside the sea in Sandfields this evening and he saw an old coal boat which had been wrecked on a stormy evening. He saw it as he walked along the beach. It was so ugly. It was, uh, it was filthy because it used to carry coal and coal dust. It was black. And now, after many storms as a wreck, it was in bits. It was ruined. And Harry Woods began to think, that's like me. That's the way I used to be. My life was ruined by sin. And he got dragged down by that. But, you know, as the time passed and as the tide flowed in quickly, the tide rose up and covered this wreck from view. And Harry Woods thought, ah, that's like a message for me, because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And in the mercy of God, he, he, he's covered over my sin, the blackness and the ruination that there was in my life. It's all covered over through the death of Jesus on my behalf. Oh, there was no joy in Harry Wood's heart. And when he got to the prayer meeting on the Saturday evening, he told his minister, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the wonderful experience he had down by the beach when he had this sense of being cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ who died for him and the joy that this had given him. These moments, these hours of holy joy were given to Harry Woods in answer to the prayers of Jesus that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Well, when you turn away from what is evil, when you encourage unity and fellowship within the body of Jesus Christ, when you embrace the joy of the gospel, the joy of the Holy Spirit fills and floods your heart. You're going along with the direction in which the prayers of Jesus are carrying you. It's as if you're going with the tide of his prayer or you're sweeping with the wind of his intercessory prayers. How wonderful to be lifted up by his prayers. How wonderful to be kept from evil by his prayers. 
How wonderful to be filled with joy in answer to these prayers of Jesus. I pray for them. Well, we'll pray together now as we come towards the end of this time of worship. God of all grace, we worship you. We give you thanks that you are the author of salvation. That salvation is not something that we dreamed up. That salvation is not something that we cobbled together or that we have to struggle to hold together. It's something that you devised. It's something that you hold together. It is something that is all of grace. And so we give thanks, thinking of the intercession of Jesus, that he holds us in his hands, that he helps us in our struggle against sin and against sin, that he prays that our hearts will be filled with joy. So... As David prayed long ago in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So may our hearts be filled to overflowing in answer to the prayers of Jesus with the joy of your salvation today and help us to commit ourselves, to commit one another and all who are in particular need into your hands. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us all. In Jesus' name. Amen.